Hello. Hello. Okay, good. We hear you now. Everyone that's going All right. here is here. Woohoo. Sorry All about right. that. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to call the May 22nd, 2020 meeting to order at 1.30 in the afternoon, not at 7 p.m. And can we have a call to order and a roll call? Commissioner Nielsen? Here. Spellman? Commissioner Spellman, I can see you. You have to unmute. <laughs> You're here. Say here. I'm here. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Dawson? Here. Conway? Here. Greenberg? Maxwell? Here. And Chair Schifrin? Here. And I take it that uh, Commissioner Greenberg's absent with uh, notification? Yes. Are there any statements of disqualification? Seeing none, we'll go to general business. Uh, the 2021 through 2025 Capital Improvement Program consistency with the general plan. Could we have a staff report, please? Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the Catherine Donovan Special Planning Commission meeting. Um, let me share my screen with you. Please bear with me. I, my computer is not as fast as I would like. Twenty one, twenty twenty five CIP GP consistency. Um, this is a requirement of state law um, that local jurisdictions um, improvement programs uh, be consistent with the general plan, um, and it's considered to be consistent if it furthers the objectives and policies of the general plan and does not obstruct their attainment. Um, and as you know, the general plan is the city's blueprint. And there are different general plans have different numbers of elements. There are certain required elements, and then some have um, other elements included. Our general plan has 10 elements, um, including housing, historic preservation, art, and culture community design, land use, mobility, economic development, civic and community facilities, hazards, safety and noise, <clears throat> parks, recreation and open space, natural resources and conservation. And um, normally most of the um, CIP are in the civic and community facilities area. This time we have uh, quite a few in the parks and recreation and open space. Um, so in the capital improvement plan, there are three categories, new projects, ongoing carryover projects, and maintenance and infill projects to existing facilities. And if you looked through the CIP at all, you'll notice that not everything that was listed as a new project was included in this analysis. And that's because each department does their own um, entry into the CIP, and they don't always um, recognize what, under state law consistency review, would be considered a new project. So usually what happens in the CIP, it's listed a new, as a new project if it has a new general ledger number, which does not necessarily mean it hasn't um, 
ever been seen before. And so there were a number of the things that were listed as new projects that actually had already been reviewed for consistency, which is why this list was not significantly longer. Um, but rest assured that we do make sure that everything gets this analysis. Um, so I have here a list of all of the projects that we analyzed and um, how they are consistent with the general plan. I, I'm not going to go over each and every one of them unless someone has a specific question about any of these projects. Um, I will just move on to the recommendation. So the finding is that the CIP is consistent with the 2030 general plan and the recommendation is that the Planning Commission by motion make the finding that the City of Santa Cruz 20, I'm sorry, I did not update this, it should be 2021-2025 Capital Improvement Plan is consistent with the City's 2030 general plan. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Do commissioners have questions on the CIP? I have uh, some questions on some of the projects. Um, I'm not sure um, that they're that they're consistency, but it's sort of like trying to understand what's happening. Um, the first okay, question I, I, I have... may or may not be able may or may not be able to answer, but I can try. Okay, and maybe if you can't, you could find out the answer and send it to us. I can, yes. So, on the PDF, the the CIP I had, there weren't page numbers that I saw, um, but on page twenty nine, the uh, PDF was the. Uh, Wolf Master Plan improvements, and $200,000 is proposed for 2021. And I just wondered what, since the draft EIR has just been released, what was in, what that $200,000 was going to uh, was intended to be spent on. And as I remember, it didn't really show um, the uh, future year projects. Um, there was just 20, 2021 showed two hundred thousand dollars, and I know the Wolf Master Plan has many other improvements, and I was just wondering why um, more weren't shown. Uh, I can't answer that question for you. Um, if you have, okay, so I can't answer questions about the. Um, CIP in general, um, those questions would need to, you know, the CIP is going to be going to council, and that would be the time to ask the questions about them. Or you can reach out to the specific department. Um, I, I'm, the, the entire CIP is way beyond my um, knowledge. So. I guess I have a little concern that we're um, determining consistency of these projects with the general plan when we don't know what the projects are. So like the WARF master plan improvements, if it, it isn't clear what $200,000 is going to um, provide for and, you know, having looked through the WARF master plan, there are certainly, you know, I think millions of dollars of improvement. So it's, I'm a little concerned that we we don't have um, the ability, we don't have any other staff from any of the departments here to okay. answer those questions, answer questions about their projects, but we're being asked to um, find that it's consistent. So the Wharf Master Plan 
has already been found to be consistent in a previous year, and you're not being asked to um, find that that project is consistent this year because it's already been determined in a prior year. Okay, even though it has not been adopted. Right, because it had to have been found to be consistent when we first approved um, a budget item for it, which was several years ago. Well, in order to save time, it might be easier for me to just send you my um, my my questions because I'm not sure who could, who would. I guess I would have to send these various questions to the different uh, departments then if I was going to try to get an answer. Um, the other, um, you know, the finance department is sort of the overarching group that puts together the capital improvement program, so it's possible they might be able to answer some of your questions. Um, probably if you want a robust answer, it would be better to go to the individual department, but if it's a, a more superficial level, uh, finance may be able to answer all of it. <coughs> I don't know whether the planning department has been involved with the downtown uh, library issue. So on page 85, there's a project for, uh, at least on my 85, that's labeled um, downtown branch measure S. And I assume that that's the rebuilding of the library downtown. Does show 20 um, I, I think Measure S was the library bond that was approved, uh, was it two years ago? Yeah. And so, it was the general bond for library improvements. That include, you know, and included, um, I don't remember how many, but several um, rebuilding of you know the, the the Capitola Library project, um, the downtown library project, and I don't know. I, th I think there were various others, but I don't remember them right off. Well, the top. in last year's CIP, the downtown library project was defined as a mixed-use project. Um, this time, it's just being a facility. Uh, a downtown branch measure S project, which I think a measure S facility remodel project. Which I think, given the status of it, makes more sense. But I just, I just wanted to clarify to to make sure that was what that was about. And then I wonder on page 134, um, it talks about um, a downtown mixed use project. Do you know what that is? Um, it's a mixed use affordable housing project. I believe that that's the, um, there is a, a mixed use project that um, is adjacent to the <coughs> Metro uh, Pacific Station. I, that's I, a different one. I, I'm sorry. I'd, okay. Then I'd, I can't answer that question right now. I just don't know. I just don't know the answer. Okay. Well. <clears throat> It just seems um, meaningless to um, say yes, it's all in conformity when we really can't get any question, specific questions answered about the projects. I understand that the staff will be there when it goes to the city council. If that's the way it is, that the, that should just it should just go to the city council. But if if we're being asked to, to make a meaningful decision, and there's no way when, before we make that decision to get questions answered. It seems like a very meaningful process. So, just Commissioner, I just want to make it clear that we're not we're not looking at the entire CIP. There are separate processes for those and different avenues for those comments. 
uh, we're really solely looking at these six projects in front of us right now that are that are new to the CIP this year and ensuring their conformance. And we've we've outlined how they how they how those each of those project goals do meet the, the general plan. Uh, Peter, you wanted to say something? Show your hand. Yeah, can can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just said, yeah, thanks for clarifying that. I think that's the way I understood the, our role today is just those six items. And I think the the larger budget that was given is more of a reference and a, you know, larger guideline, but we're really tasked with conforming or con making sure that those six items conform with the general plan. My bigger question, though, however, is just, you know, in light of – so I don't understand completely budget processes for the municipality, and I'm sure the community at large doesn't completely understand that. What what happens, for example, given you know the situation we're faced with today, with you know severe economic ramifications from from the whole the whole COVID scenario going on? Does this budget get reworked and priorities? potentially change um, and and how would that process work? I know you don't may not you may, may not be able to give a full answer, but I'm just looking for some general sense of how that process would take place. My understanding is um, Martin Bernal has been keeping staff um, updated on what is going on citywide, and my understanding is that they instead of uh, passing the annual budget the way they normally do as a one-year budget, they are passing uh, a working budget, which they're required by law to have an annual budget. So this is their, um, this is the way that they're moving forward in the, these uncertain times, is that they're passing a working budget that will um, carry us through the next month or two, um, I think, Actually, I think the next time they're planning to come back is in September, and then, um, and then um, they would go like every two months, be coming forward with a revised budget based on new information. If I could add something, okay, I mean, the, sure, the, go ahead. The council adopts an operating budget and a capital budget each year. And the capital budget talks about uh, or makes allocations to specific projects that they hope that the council is hoping will be constructed over the next year. The CIP is really a planning document. It's a way of projecting, um, you know, what the priorities are for the city five years down the road, and it can change every year. Um, so there's no this. It's not a, this doesn't. Uh, a, Approving the CIP doesn't tie the city actually into anything because even with the capital budget, if depending on what the economic realities turn out to be, that that can change. But the the, the strength of a CIP is that it lets the the decision makers, the staff, and the community sort of look down the road and see well what are the projects that are the high priority projects? What is the city? trying to get money for what is the city intending to do. So I think it's a it's an important decision. I I while I understand what the staff approach is, um, determinations of consistency aren't set in stone. Um, one council can decide a project is consistent and the next council can can decide that it's not consistent or it needs to change in a certain way to be consistent. So while I think generally it's best to focus on um, what are the new projects, I don't think that's a requirement. I think the commission, if it wanted to, could look at other previous determinations, and if there was a desire to recommend a change in the, uh, whether a particular project is consistent or not based on uh, new concerns or new information, that's totally appropriate. So that's, at least that's my understanding of it. Do any other commissioners have questions about the CIP? 
Would somebody like to move the staff recommendation? Julie, are you moving the staff recommendation or do you want to speak? Yeah, I'll, I'll move the staff recommendation. Is there a second? A second. Peter seconding it. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Oh, aye. wait a minute. I'm sorry. We need a roll call. <laughs> okay. Um, Commissioner Nielsen. Aye. Stallman. Aye. Dawson. Aye. Conway. Conway. Couldn't hear you saying I, but. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maxwell. Aye. Chair Schifrin. Aye. Thank you. Passes unanimously. Uh, so let's now go on to the next item, which is. Let me find my. Okay. We are now on item number two, the electric vehicle charging station expedited processing ordinance and amendment to the local coastal program, impl excuse me, implementation plan. Could we have a staff report, please? Okay, thank you. Um, let me just get this up and running. Is this you again, Catherine? It's me. You get me all day today. <laughs> or at least as much of the day as your meeting is. <laughs> okay. Uh, we are coming forward with a, a, an ordinance to amend our municipal code um, to comply with uh, Assembly Bill 1236 that was passed in 2015. Um, that made changes to the government code section to expedite permits for electric charging stations. And um, the majority of this amendment is um, in the building code section of the municipal code 1806, um, which the commission does not have purview over. However, um, there were two small changes that we made in addition to that, that adding that section. One was to our design permit um, standards to or de design permit section to um, exempt the electric vehicle charging stations from the requirement to do a design permit, and that is required under state law. And then the second change, in our existing parking lot standards, it specifically says that um, the parking lot standards refer to um, electric vehicle charging stations um, level two. And we, since we were doing these changes anyway, we wanted to uh, make an, a minor change there to allow um, higher level charging stations to also fulfill the requirements in our parking lots. I think at the time that it was originally written, um, the higher level charging stations were not really um, in existence yet. And so uh, this is just to bring our code up to date. Um, there are some other actions that are involved with this. The, um, the amendment, the sections in the zoning ordinance are also part of the local coastal program implementation. And so it will involve an LCP amendment. Um, and there's an also a requirement that the city have on its website a building permit checklist that um, can be used to ensure that um, when a building permit is submitted for an electric vehicle charging station, that everything, if everything on the checklist is submitted, it is um, then uh, qualifies for the expediting process. We are already using that checklist and have been for some time. 
um, but it is a requirement of the law. Um, and uh, another requirement is that we accept electronic permit submittals. And we have accepted permit submittals on some other very simple permits in the past, um, things like water heaters. We had not gotten our permit system uh, for plan submittals up and running yet, but um, we, with the COVID encouraging us to come up with alternative means to um, get through our, our various building processes, we now have our, our blue beam, it's called, is, is up and running and we can do the electronic permit submittal. Um, there is a, a caveat in the law that allows jurisdictions that can't accept electronic submittals um, a, a waiver for that, but we're hoping that we'll be up and running um, by the time this gets through our approval process. So our recommendation is that the Planning Commission recommend to City Council to approve the ordinance and approve the resolution adopting the LCP amendment and authorizing the City Manager to submit the LCP amendment to the Coastal Commission. And if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer. Okay, do commissioners have any questions? Uh, Christian? Um, I don't, it's not so much a question, but just a comment on, um, on the checklist that you, that was provided. There is a typo in that. And so I just wanted to call that oh. to your attention so you could take care of that. Um, the, yeah, the first paragraph, the last sentence of the first paragraph, um, um, you'll just see that before, in front of the word help, you need to have a, a word, a, you know, to help. Um, needs to be added in there, so that's it. Okay, thank you. I did not You're write welcome. that myself, so <laughs> I'll make No judgment, I was just calling to somebody's attention. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or it's comments? Much appreciated. Okay, um, I didn't ask before, are any members of the public uh, called in for this meeting? No. There are no members of the public on the line. Thank you. Um, I, I assume that this LCP amendment will be submitted to the Coastal Commission and they'll consider it like a minor amendment, so it shouldn't take long for it to be uh, um, approved. Is that kind of the intent? Yes, and we've actually had a really good working relationship with the um, Coastal Commission staff recently. so. I, I think they will expedite it as much as possible. Um, you know, we let them know when things are coming. They tell us it's either a minor amendment or de minimis, and frankly, I don't really understand the difference between them, but um, it, it should go through as quickly as they can make it. Their process is a little slow, so I would imagine it will be a couple of months, um, but it'll be as fast as they can make it. Does that mean that the uh, ordinance only is in effect 30 days after the council approves it outside of the coastal zone and it's not in effect inside the coastal zone until the Coastal Commission approves it? Uh, technically, yes, it, although we have been um, operating under the state law, so the changes to the ordinance are a, a legal requirement and a cleanup for us, but we are not, you know, the, the, the practical matter is that we have been expediting these, um, these uh, submittals already, and we don't require a design permit in the, um, for any uh, electronic vehicle charging stations. So the, the practical effect is it doesn't matter. There won't be a, a difference but technically you are correct. Okay, and, and is there some grant that the city's going to, uh, after that is going to be, uh, the city's going to qualify for by approving these recommendations? 
Uh, it's not a grant. There, um, if you recall, there was the uh, scandal with the Volkswagen having um, conflated or uh, fraudulently claimed their uh, gas mileage on their vehicles, and as part of the settlement on that um, lawsuit, they they are one of the things they are doing is in installing a large number of electric vehicle charging stations, and the contractor that they're using in I think all of California, but at least Northern California, um, had some experience, very unfavorable experience in another jurisdiction that had not adopted the streamlining um, regulations. And so they're ready to move in and put a number of these charging stations in the city, but are reluctant to do so if we don't have the ordinance in place. Do you know if the county is, is following a similar process or not? Or the other I don't cities? know. I think uh, the, the state law required smaller jurisdictions to adopt this ordinance by 2018, and um, I imagine, I, I read somewhere that I think it was 60% had complied with that. Um, so we are not alone in being a little late, but I don't know if the county or other local jurisdictions have already done this or not. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other any questions or comments? If not, would somebody like to move the staff recommendation? Um, I'll move to accept the staff recommendation. Is there a second? A second. Is there any further discussion? Do we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Nielsen? Aye. Spellman? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Conway? Uh, waves, yes. <laughs> Julie? <laughs> we'll come back to you. <laughs> Maxwell? Aye. Chair Schifrin? Aye. Passes unanimously. Let's move on to item number three, the general plan report. We're going to get through an item that's been on about the last three agendas, I think. And we're finally <laughs> getting. So, could we have a staff report, please? Okay, there is no report on this. This is a uh, an item that we bring to you as a courtesy. It's required. Uh, we have an annual uh, report that is required to be submitted to um, the State Department of Housing and Community Development on our. General plan compliance and our uh, housing on an update, and um, those those reports are presented to the council um, prior to the April 1st deadline to submit the plans to the state, um, and then we normally uh, we actually wish that we could get it to the planning commission prior to that, but normally we're working on this right up until the last minute because it's a pretty extensive report. Um, and so this year, as in previous years, we were prepared to um, bring it to you just as a, a courtesy so you could have that information in April, but unfortunately that meeting was canceled. And then the second meeting it was on ran until after 11. And so it was continued and now we're finally here. Um, so. Uh, I don't have a presentation for you, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Do any of the any commissioners have questions for staff? I have um, a couple. One of them, and I'm trying to remember, I don't have the report in front of me, but as, as I remember, there was a survey that was done on uh, rent levels and ADUs. Um, is that correct? Am I remembering that correctly? Yes, that's correct. And if I'm remembering the the determination of what category and arena numbers to put the ADUs 
was based on a kind of averaging of the um, responses that staff received. And, and I, if I'm remembering correctly, it was a pretty good response rate. It was a surprisingly high response rate for these kinds of surveys. Am, am I remembering this correctly? Yes, you are. And the survey itself was done for a different purpose. It was um, it was done while Sarah Noisy was working on last year's um, ADU update, and we were trying to get information for that. So the intent was not related to this report. However, we always have this problem with we have all these ADUs. We know that a lot of them are being rented at a lower rent than uh, market rate, and we want to be able to use them, um, and there is a mechanism to use them. And normally we just do a, you know, I, I go online and go to all the different uh, rental sites and try and see what kind of uh, rent are being charged. But this year, since we had this survey, um, we used that data. And the survey was, was set up so that it was, looking at rents within a range for um, uh, ADUs within a size range. And so we took a very conservative approach here. We made the assumption that each ADU was only housing one person, which is, as you can imagine, a pretty conservative um, assumption. And then we took um, we didn't actually take the average. We took the, for each um, size category, we took the, the uh, uh, I think it's called the mode, um, the, where they, the, the most, uh, the range of price was for most of the houses in, or most of the ADUs in that. And, um, characterize them by that, and then using the state housing um, uh, uh, income rates for housing, we've calculated which category each of these were. And basically, we had a cutoff at if, if an ADU was less than 650 <clears throat> square feet, it qualified as a um, low income. And if it was greater than 650 square feet, it qualified for um, moderate income. And unfortunately, we we didn't look at rents below a thousand dollars a month, and so we couldn't. That's too high to qualify as very low. So we weren't able to see if any of our ADUs might have qualified as very low. Um, and one other caveat is that a fair number. I think it was. Close to a third of the ADUs are basically rent-free because they're going to family members, um, and we just didn't we just didn't use that data um, because we it didn't figure it, it. It would it would be tough to um, to argue that these were being rented at zero because they were simply being provided to family members. Does that pretty much answer your question? Um, it helps me understand what was done. I think particularly now that the ADUs are ministerial and that they're now, at least during this period, they're not going to have a uh, owner occupancy requirement. I I think they they could they're likely to be a, an even more important um, component of the what's considered the new housing stock, although I imagine uh, many of them are going to be uh, legalized. It seems like that's happening now because it's so much easier to legalize them um, without the owner occupancy requirement. I think it would be very helpful to do a survey of, even if it's just a sample survey, and but a survey that is really based on the income ranges for the RENA numbers, the very low, low, moderate, and above moderate, to really get a sense of how many of those units are in each of those categories. The general feeling is that um, the, the 
AGUs are potentially an affordable housing, a part of the affordable housing supply. And I think as more of these are being um, put on the market, it would be useful to find out to what extent is that true. So from my perspective, the size doesn't isn't as important as just knowing what the income, what the rent, what the rents are charged, what rents are charged, and whether those rents are within the range for the the various uh, RENA categories. And I just think as that as ADUs become a, a more significant part of our uh, the annual housing distribution, um, we should try to refine how well they. Um, you know, they reflect uh, diff how well they're being made available to various income categories. So I don't know what the city, is, what the staff is intending for next time, but I would certainly urge that uh, there be a real effort to uh, look at how the um, how the um, how those units are being rented, who they are, what their rent, what the rent levels are. Cindy, did you have a comment? I see your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to, to second what you said, Andy, and, and encourage staff. Um, and I'm not sure what the requirements are and why there was a, a 650 square foot cutoff. It seems to me if we're doing these surveys, we need to be doing them the same way that housing authorities and others look at at housing stock, and so is it a one bedroom, is it a studio, um, and so regardless of the size, and then make those income determinations uh, based on, on a, a similar scale, essentially. Um, I do agree that there, there is the potential for, for ADUs to be um, address the needs uh, that were the, the low and very low income. But I think um, just knowing people in the rental market and knowing people who work in housing, um, there are a lot of these very small units that w would not, if you did the math according to the housing authority of a, a studio um, and how, how much a studio would be in that very low income range or low income range, um, the rents being charged are, are much above that. So I would just really encourage us to get more precise about that information and also do it on a scale that where we're comparing kind of apples to apples so that, you know, it's compared um, whether it's a, a studio or a one-bedroom or a two-bedroom, regardless of the square footage. Thank you. Any other commissioners want to weigh in on the general plan report? Yes. Christian? Um, I had a question, um, just in terms of I was, you know, in looking at the at the arena numbers and looking at the very low um, category. Obviously, we're um, you know we we have a number that's um, that's high, that, you know a high number that needs to be addressed um, still. Um, and I'm curious if do, has staff looked at other has compared maybe compared our numbers against other communities um, and um, looked at you know how you know if other communities are in the same um, kind of in the same boat on this. Um, I, I did a little bit of research, but you know I didn't have. I'm not really sure where to look, um, but I did kind of see that there's rankings and grade levels given for different jurisdictions, but um, but I'm just curious you know how we stack up against other communities. Um, you know, the, the RENA distribution is at a regional level, um, and within our region, uh, I think generally Santa Cruz is expected to grow more than many of the other jurisdictions in our region, so we usually get the, um, a larger sh percentage share than other communities. That said, I, I believe that they're pretty careful about um, the distribution of of the income levels. Um, so pretty pretty uh, carefully, so that if say we got, I'm just making numbers up here. If we got 50% of the area 
um, housing requirement, we would also get 50% of the very low. But I think the problem is that there's a higher need for the very low, and so those numbers are 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 based on what the need is, not on what the um, how practical it is to build that number. You know, it's very particularly now that we don't have redevelopment, it's really hard to get those very low income units. And um, just anecdotally, I've heard from jurisdictions all around the state, and we all have the same problem. It's it's quite expensive. Um, you have to to be able to subsidize these units, and they're very expensive to build. So it's mm -hmm. it's you know we we use what tools we have, but it's hard. It's hard to get those numbers. I right. think they are. I mean, I, I, I sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to say, too, Commissioner. Yeah. Oh, you can you can finish, Catherine. Okay, I think very very few, if any, jurisdictions statewide have actually met their arena, and it's because of those those very low units. You know, they're in a lot of other jurisdictions are like we are. They could provide the overall <clears throat> housing number, but getting those very low units is almost impossible. Monaco. Just, and just for a for a sense, Commissioner, of these numbers, it's about 3% of all cities in California are currently meeting the arena, um, and only about 25% are meeting the other, like, three of the four categories, which is what Santa mm -hmm. Cruz falls in. So we are doing better than, than most. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think... From my, in terms of me asking this question, it's more uh, what I'm trying to understand is, um, I mean, I know that Santa Cruz is doing. I mean, when I looked at when I did the research, I, I know that Santa Cruz is doing a good job. Um, obviously, we could be doing better. Um, but what I'm trying to understand is, are there communities or jurisdictions that are doing a better job at meeting these very low numbers. And I, and I know that the, that it's difficult. I know it's difficult to produce these very low units, very low income units. Um, but there's, but you know, we have a, there's a goal, right? I mean, so how do we, how do we reach that goal and how do we, how do we get there? Um, so what I'm, what I'm wondering is, is are there other communities that are, possibly doing a better job at, at meeting that very low um, income uh, number that we could be looking at and seeing what, what is it that they're, that they're doing? Are they, are, are they incentivizing, um, or are they, sub, are they subsidizing, um, you know, to, to developers or are they creating incentives that are unique to their, um, to their area that, um, that we could be looking at to help, um, to help for us, for us to provide incentive to, to developers as well, because you know uh, you know it's going to happen one way or the other. Either the the city needs to the city has to build these, um, which we're not seeing that happening, or developers have to build them. And if developers are going to build them, they they're not going to with it being as expensive as it is, they're not going to just do it because they want to. I mean, they're going to need some incentive to do that. So. Um, that's what I'm wondering is, are there other, can we be looking at, you know, other communities that are possibly doing a good job with, with that number? Cause that obviously that's the number that we're having, you know, or the very low is the, is the category we're having a very difficult time with. So that's, that's what, that, that's my reasoning for bringing that up. Um, as far as I know, all jurisdictions are struggling with the same problem and the, mm -hmm. There are specific jurisdictions that, well, as Matt said, 3% have actually met their very low um, RENA numbers. And I think we are using the same tools as other jurisdictions. We're using our, our remaining um, uh, redevelopment funds. We're using our affordable trust house, uh, trust fund Affordable Housing Trust Fund funds, 
and we're using things like the density bonus. Um, and mm-hmm. I have been pushing hard to encourage whenever we have a project that wants to use a density bonus to use to to push to get the very low income housing, even if you know we would get you know one or two units of very low income rather than five or six units of low income because mm-hmm. we need those very low income much more. Um, and actually, Julie might be able to speak to this a bit. Do you have anything to add to this, Julie? Do you know of anybody who has better tools than we do? You have to unmute, Julie. I think I need, oh, there we are. There you go. I don't think, okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, I, Catherine, you're right. The tools that um, are available, the only way to get very low income units built is with public financing. Um, there are very limited uh, public financing tools available. I think the city does a really good job of leveraging what is available. Um, It's the reason why it's important, um, why it's an important option for certain projects to be able to pay into that trust fund because we get the much more deeply targeted units um, affordable when they're built by publicly financed projects Mm -hmm. such as those that use low-income housing tax credits. Um, So I, I agree with you, Catherine. Every tool available needs to be used. The city's doing that. They're doing project-based Section 8 wherever they can. Um, and the very low-income units are going to be really hard to build. Right. I'd like to add something to that because I think the RENA numbers are really built on a big lie. And the lie is that if you require the local jurisdictions to set aside um, to identify a particular need for very low income units, um, that somehow is going to create the units. When, as Julie said and and Catherine said, it's incredibly uh, expensive per unit to make a a unit available to very low income people. What that, the reason I call it a big lie is that the other part of that distribution of um, uh, RENA numbers is that for very low income units, for a jurisdiction to justify that they've provided the opportunity for low-income units, they have to provide higher density, uh, higher density zoning. And so the jurisdictions are required to have uh, provide enough units, the zoning that would allow for the um, construction of their arena, their arena low, very low-income units without any requirement whatsoever at the state level that those units B for very low income people or without any really, uh, with a very limited uh, um, federal subsidy um, to, or state subsidy to provide those units. So what the, the effect of um, the RENA numbers is really to generate high density development in all the communities in the state without necessarily getting any, um, any additional affordable units. We get some through uh, the city's aggressive attempts, and I think the county as well has been pretty aggressive in trying to get those subsidies, but it's never gonna really meet the RENA numbers. On the other hand, for communities that may not wanna have, and I think at least when I knew last, it was at least 20 units an acre uh, have to be um, made available, there has to be zoning that would allow for the arena numbers at 20 units an acre. What it's really doing is recurring, uh, in my view, is just encouraging high density market rate units. That's the, that's the effect of it. Because without those uh, deep subsidies from the federal, state, and local level, those very low income units are never gonna get built. That's how I see it. So any other commissioner comments? Uh, Catherine, I just want to ask, is there, uh, do you think there is going to be another survey next year of uh, ADUs to try to get an uh, uh, update?
updated information on their um, rent levels? Um, well, I think that what you that having a survey that's specifically um, trying to get at these RENA numbers and and the rent levels would be really good. We we know from experience that people don't like to fill out surveys, and so um, when Sarah did this survey, she did a really good job of keeping it simple. And people, especially if they see it as being personal information, just don't necessarily turn it in. We got some, not too many, but we got some really rude responses um, from the survey. And um, I think we will try to design another one. We'll try to do the same thing where it goes out. The, the ADU owners need to certify annually that they <coughs> are indeed living at the property. And so sending this out with that certification, um, I think, helps get our response rate higher. So we will certainly try to, to do that. But it's, a, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a quick and easy thing to design. And you know how our time is constrained here. So we, we will aim for it. I think those letters go out in April or May. So we've missed this year. Um, but we will try to get a survey in place in time to go out with next year's letters. Okay. Any commissioners who want to have any final comments on this? There is no need for us to um, make a recommendation or, or pass a motion. So um, if there are no other comments, we'll just move to adjournment. And I can never remember whether we need a motion to adjourn or whether the chair just says we are now adjourned. The chair. Uh, okay, so our rules are, uh, as the chair, I'll just say we are now adjourned. Thank you very much. Oh, when is our next meeting? June 4th. June 4th, so it's at the regular time. Um, yes, and um, uh, I believe uh, the 914, 916 Seabright item is uh, one of the matters on the agenda. Okay, thank you very much. So I'll see you all on the 4th, if not sooner.